we have one more week left um, and a lot of things happening in this week. So you know, you have a homework that uh, I know that several of you are working on and making good progress on. Um, it's due on the 23rd, that's Tuesday. And then there's this, all these project submissions that are due on the same day. And there's a final exam next Thursday in this room um, at 10.30. It will cover everything that we, we did uh, after the midterm plus all of learning theory. So we did a little bit of learning theory before the midterm. That also is fair game. Any questions about these things? Yeah, we have, it's due. Yes. So we're not going to have class on Tuesday? We will have class on Tuesday, yes. Uh, we will have class on Tuesday, and uh, that will be the last one. Can you speak up? No, it will be like a wrap up, just looking back at everything, and then also connections to broader aspects beyond just the technical things that we saw. Yes. Are there going to be any final review sessions, whether that's TA or? Uh, I wasn't planning on one, but we can make my next office hours a final review session. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, I need to make sure that the time works out and I probably would need to book a conference room. Um, but that's about it. Yeah. It usually ends up being informally a review session anyway, the last office hours, so might as well make it that. Another announcement is uh, something that was already posted, I think, on Piazza, but uh, there's an optional PyTorch tutorial tomorrow uh, at 3 p.m. in room 3115, maybe. And uh, you don't need to go if you don't feel like it, it's fine. Uh, and you can always pick up PyTorch using online tutorials. Um, it'll be about an hour long. And just uh, to kind of give some context here, PyTorch is one of the leading uh, machine learning libraries that's out there. It's, uh, uh, it's for uh, designing arbitrary neural networks and it's industrial strength, and it's used both in research and in the industry. Um, it's one of the largest, uh, uh, or I, I believe it may be the most used neural network library out there. And so it might be worth learning the stuff. I'll, I'll mention libraries uh, um, that you can pick up. In fact, I can say it now. I mean, PyTorch is one of them. Uh, if you are working in a Google, uh, ecosystem, then you'd probably have to use TensorFlow. There's a library called JAX, J-A-X. Uh, that's also a machine, that's also a neural network library that has slightly different assumptions. All of these are in Python. Um, another sort of a, a default machine learning library that tends to get used a lot is uh, scikit-learn, uh, which is which you can get using, uh, it's also in Python, so you can use this and so on. And all of these have extensive documentation and really, really large libraries. Um, pretty much everything you might be able to think of is implemented in one of these uh, places. This is just in Python. Other languages have their own machine learning libraries. Um, and of course, this class is not about any one library or another. The hope is, based on the content uh, that you encounter in this class through the semester, the basis of these libraries will be clear, and that way you'll be able to make the right choices when you're using them. I'm assuming that you can all read documentation and pick it up. But if you're interested in like a walkthrough of how to get started with PyTorch, I think with uh, Jupyter Node, with maybe Google Colab or something like that, um, uh, make sure to be there. Uh, if you've not seen that room, that room is not this big. So it's not going to be, uh, you know, the, there's going to be like some space limitation there. So if you're interested, be there, but you don't have to. Uh, will this tutorial be recorded? We weren't planning on it being recorded, but we'll make the material available uh, once it's done. Any other questions? So, how long will be Currently, we are planning one hour, and uh, one of the TAs will be handling it. So. A few other things I wanted to mention about the project. Um, Sorry, uh, about the homework. Um, several of, several people I met uh, on Tuesday mentioned that uh, um, they, they, they were getting only minus one. The model was predicting only minus one. Uh, and there was also some discussion about this on Piazza. Uh, 
there were a couple of reasons that this could happen. One of them is the hyperparameter that we gave you, C, turns out it's not particularly great. The range of hyperparameters we gave you. If you're interested, and only if you're interested in exploring it a little bit more, uh, try larger values of C. Uh, that's one. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, there is a common bug that I observed in at least two or three uh, students' code, which is uh, you don't have the bias feature uh, as uh, you don't have the bias as a, as a feature inside the weight. You update the bias separately, but you don't update it uh, in all the places it needs update. So it's a tricky bug to find because your weights seem to be changing. There seems to be some convergence, but your bias is not working out. So it's a, uh, a if you look at your code and uh, if what I just said makes sense and you are able to fix that bug, maybe that will help. Okay. And if this makes no sense and if this does not line up with your code at all, don't worry about it. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I'm assuming like the bias would be similar to perfect on how we were doing, but then the update is different than perfect on. So it's yes. a different formula for bias as well. Yes. Uh, in fact, in the last lecture, I did uh, uh, write it up, but it's easy to derive it from the standard uh, thing. So the update, we have two sides, right? We have uh, if y w transpose x is less than or equal to one. That's one side of the update. And the other one is if y w transpose x is greater than or equal to one. If the bias was explicitly present, this would be if y, I need to move that. w transpose x plus b is less than or equal to one. And here it's y times Well, it's not greater than or equal to, but I'm, it doesn't really hurt getting rid of the equality here. So let's not do that. So uh, the, the red stuff is if the bias was explicitly present. On what, on the update that we saw was on this side, the update was uh, uh, you, you you update both the, uh, you do both the shrinking and also the weight update. So you have W is W times one minus the learning rate, let's call that gamma, plus gamma C Y X. Whereas here it is W is W times one minus gamma. This was the SVM update, but if the bias term was explicitly present, you need to update both the terms. So W will still be the same. In addition, you need to update the bias term. B is you shrink the bias exactly like the, it's another weight. Remember, the bias term is nothing but a weight associated with a feature whose value is equal to one. That's the way I'm, uh, you need to derive this. Plus gamma C Y and the feature is one. Whereas here, there's no feature. So bias is, so that's the update. And often uh, the, the couple of, uh, at least two or three instances, I saw uh, students forgot this bit. Uh, there's a question, can we use sklearn for extra credit to create decision trees over SVM? No, you can't. I expect that uh, for homeworks, you need to use uh, your own implementation of uh, the decision tree. Uh, the only place where I'm allowing a library is for at most one submission in the project. Okay, any other questions? If not, let's uh, continue our conversation about, yep, there's a question. So if our um, core vector machine is predicting um, all negative values, can we just use the hyperparameters of that? Try, it, it could be a bug of this kind, what I just described, or it could be that the hyperparameter is bad. Uh, I do know that given the hyperparameters you have, you will not, there are certain combinations for which you will not get all negatives. Uh, but if you really want to see whether it works, I, I have two suggestions. Try increasing the value of C. Um, 
And the general rule of thumb here for those hyperparameters is uh, you just need to try in orders of magnitude. So, for example, in the homework, I asked you to try 10 power, uh, 1, 1 tenth, 10 power minus 2, and so on. Try 10 power 2, 10 power 3. Just see what happens. Uh, that's one. Another suggestion I have is to see whether which of these cases is happening is to debug your code. And debugging stochastic code is easier said than done. So rather than just debugging it by eyeballing it or using the data set we provided, create a tiny data set with two features and one label that you know is linearly separable. And run your um, SVM to convergence. If you have only two features, you can run for 100 epochs very quickly. Let it run for 100 epochs. So the data set could be something like, uh, let's say you have two features. I'm going to call that x0 and x1. That's a minus one, by the way. So let me write. So you have these two features. And I can have a label, which is, uh, say, this junction. You know this data is linearly separable. You know the theory tells you that your SVM should find a classifier that perfectly classifies the data set. And in fact, you can even derive what that hyperplane should be. It should be something like x0 plus x1 is greater than equal to 1, or actually greater than equal to half. Uh, well, that's only if the x0s and x1s are my, uh, zeros and ones. In this case, it will be slightly different. But you can derive what the uh, uh, the hyperplane would be, and you can check. So a good sanity check is: Does your SVM converge to a hyperplane that perfectly classifies these four examples? If it does, then at least one class of bugs does not exist. Another thing to check is to actually examine the weights of the, the that SVM. Um, the the weights associated with W0, X0, and X1. Because the disjunction is a symmetric function, X0 or X1 is the same as X1 or X0. The weights associated with these features should be the same or should be very, very close to each other. These are useful sort of sanity checks. And if that does not work, then you can actually step through the code because there are only two features. So there are only four possible uh, uh, input, you you can actually derive the update on paper and verify if it works. I have personally discovered many bugs in my SVM implementation over the years using something like this. And it's much better to do this than to actually debug it on a data set that you don't control. Other questions? Did I miss any hands? Is it a good idea to use tree plus SVM from homework six in a project? You can always try it, and that would count as a separate uh, um, uh, algorithm. When performing the transformations with the trees and their predictions, do we append the training labels to this new data set? Yes. So when you're performing the transformations, uh, I, I don't understand the question. You, of course, need the training label uh, because you're treating each tree as a, or the collection of trees as a collective feature transformation, you still need a label uh, that you're going to uh, train on. And so you will still need the label from the training data. Maybe I misunderstood the question and maybe one of the TAs can follow up on that. All right, I'm going to switch now to um, neural networks. We were talking about neural networks and this Will be a uh, wind up. Yes, I missed a question. Oh, sorry. Um, the question on the bias term that you said has to be a bit added to the along with the database. So, do we add a bias to the hinge law calculation as well? Or that's an interesting question. So, the hinge. Has... Yes. So, anytime you have W transpose X, you replace it with W transpose X plus B. Yeah. Because W transpose X, the way I presented it, Im implicitly contained the bias. So you you need to perform the same calculation. So we've seen neural networks. We've seen uh, what they are. We've seen how to train with them, uh, how to predict with them. In the last lecture, we saw the backpropagation algorithm that um, 
computes the gradient that can be plugged into stochastic gradient descent. Today, we're going to look at some practical concerns um, of which there are many, many uh, that we have to deal with when we are um, when we want to deploy or uh, train neural networks. One big issue is unlike perceptron, unlike SVM and unlike logistic regression, if we are training a neural network uh, with more than one layer using the stochastic gradient descent algorithm, there is no guarantee that we will converge to the global minimum of the loss function. Why? Because the loss function itself does not is not convex, and if it's not convex, it may it may look something like this. So depending on where you start, if you start here, you might end up here. If you start here, you might end up here. But really, you should have started here and ended up here because that's the best, uh, that, that's the lowest thing. So depending on where you start, you might end up in a different uh, minimum. So different, uh, and, and in fact, there are certain classes of neural networks where even this property is not uh, going to be satisfied. What we might end up with is uh, something called a saggy point which is neither a minimum nor a maximum, but there's a region of flatness in the loss. So that's a problem. And there is nothing that we can do to fix it other than um, uh, you know, try uh, with other initialization. In practice, curiously, um, different minima don't always perform too differently from each other provided the neural network is big enough and the data is large enough. And the data tends to be really large. Because the data tends to be really large, and because you're going to be running your training for many, many thousands of updates, you, at this point, we no longer talk about number of epochs, but we talk about how many times are we updating the neural network. We might be updating the neural network hundreds of thousands of times. And this means that we need you know, if you think your homework takes a lot of time to run because your SVM is taking 20 minutes to converge, imagine running your learning algorithm for a few months. That's how, how much effort it takes to train the largest models today. And this is few months not on a machine like the CHPC, but on some of the largest compute clusters in the world. And uh, there's nothing that we can do about it. In fact, uh, there are even specialized hardware that have been invented or designed just to support training and inference with neural networks. Uh, Google's uh, tensor processing unit, it's called TPU, is a custom hardware that is designed for basically doing the operations that we have in neural networks. And all the training happens on TPUs. This presents a lot of problems. Let's assume that the code has no bugs. Let's pretend that we know that our code has no bugs, which itself is kind of a complicated thing. But even then, training a neural network is not just running a program once. You need to uh, decide how long you want to train it for, how many updates do you want, or how many epochs or such things. And the termination criteria, we had a discussion about this in the last lecture, the termination criteria can be complicated. Um, you can't decide upfront that I'm going to train it for this amount of time um, and hope that it's correct. You need some way to know that your choices make sense. Some options in the literature uh, and in practice tend to be, uh, first of all, if you're just playing around with the data, you can just pick a certain number of epochs and hope it works. You could also have a threshold on how much training error or how much validation error you're willing to tolerate. So once the validation error goes below a certain threshold, you stop, which means that after every block of update, for example, after every epoch, you compute the validation error and or accuracy or something. And when it crosses a desirable threshold, you decide that you've trained enough. Another possibility is you train longer than that, and then you come back and pick the model that you picked, that, that gave the lowest validation error. That means that you need to store the model at every uh, every time you compute the validation error, you also need to save the model to disk. So you need to checkpoint. So you need the entire infrastructure around checkpointing. Um, 
There are other heuristics also. The, the, one of the more interesting heuristics involves uh, using something called scaling loss to discover that uh, if I have a model of this size and if I have a data set of this size, then it's sufficient to train it for this number of uh, updates based on other models that have been trained on other data sets. So it's almost like a discovering a law of physics about training dynamics. And that has seen a lot of uh, um, uh, sort of lot of research in the last maybe three to four years. Of course, you also do want to avoid local minimum because it's possible you get really unlucky and you end up in like one of those shallow parts of the neural network where the local minima make, make no sense. So maybe, uh, sorry, shallow parts of the objective. Imagine that your objective function looks something like this. And we are minimizing this function. Ideally, we would like to be here, but for the most part, you'll end up somewhere here. You can get very unlucky. So how do we get out of these sorts of unlucky situations? One answer, a very unpleasant answer, is don't train once, train many times. Initialize your model multiple times and run multiple random parallel uh, training uh, sessions. That way you get multiple models and then you, you combine them in whatever fashion you want. Maybe you pick the one that has the lowest loss. Maybe you pick the one that has the best validation set performance. Maybe you pick the one, you pick all of them and at test time, you use some sort of an ensemble. You create an ensemble and do some voting or something like that. And this idea shows up even like with the largest models today. Uh, for instance, there is a large language model called Mextral, which is really an ensemble of eight different models. It's a complicated ensemble, but still an ensemble. There are rumors that GPT-4 is an ensemble of uh, eight or something GPT-3s. Um, or it, It's not clear, but because it's all proprietary. I say there are rumors because these are based on tweets. So we can't, <laughs> I, I don't know what that means. Anyway, so the, the, the short uh, version of this is training neural networks with FGD is more complicated than just running your code because in addition to everything else, you have to deal with the fact that you're optimizing a function and you have every round, sorry, uh, every uh, run of SGD can take a lot of time and its success is determined by all the parameters that you pick. One other idea that shows up a lot, in fact, is the default, is something called a mini batch. We've seen stochastic gradient descent. And the way I presented stochastic gradient descent was you pick one random example and you pretend that this random example is the entirety of your data. You write down the loss function with that random example, take the gradient, take a gradient set. Who says you have to pick only one example when you're doing this? Why not two examples? If you have 100,000 examples, you pick two random examples, pretend that they are your entire data set, write down the loss function, and uh, compute the gradient and take a gradient step. But why should you stop with two? Why not 12? Why not 16? Why not all 10,000 or all the entire data set? Well, if you take the entire data set, you're back to batch the standard gradient descent and its problems show up. Computing the gradient can take a lot of time. So many batches are like a sweet spot in between these two extremes. At one extreme, we have each update is built with just one example. That's your, that's the default, uh, that's the uh, original stochastic gradient descent. You pick one random example, you take a gradient. At the other extreme, you don't have any stochastic gradients. You just compute the gradient using all the examples that you have. A mini batch is a, uh, uh, an in-between thing where you pick a subset of the examples at any point, and you pretend that this is your entire data set, you compute the gradient, and you take a gradient set. Any questions about this? So for each step, uh, for the mini batch, the loss function will be different from the, the one sample. 
Yes. Yes. So, so yep. At the, at the different parts, only at the, the arrow part, the, the, the sum of arrow part. Yes, part. that's right. That's exactly right. You're, you just write a sum of sum over the mini batch. Yes. But this introduces a new hyperparameter, the size of the mini batch. Um, if your mini batch is really small, the smallest it can get is one. Mm -hmm. Then you are in. Uh, you are getting your your gradients can be very very uh, can have high variance because each example can give can point in a random direction in the gradient in the in the lost space. If your mini batch is really large, mm -hmm. then you have to do a lot of computation at every step. So you want some sweet spot. It uh, it uh, the size of the mini batch. This hyperparameter can control how fast your learning converges. Thankfully, uh, the rule of thumb here is your mini batch should be as big as your hardware can account um, in parallel. So that's pretty much it. So you see numbers like my mini, uh, mini batch sizes of say sixty four or one twenty eight or something like that. It doesn't get too big, but you can fit all the gradients and the module and all of that in the uh, GPU memory and you can take the gradient step. And uh, uh, whenever you're trying to, you know, when you read research papers, somewhere it uh, they, they have to say what the what mini batch size they used. And if they don't say it and they say they use PyTorch, then you can assume that they use whatever is PyTorch's default for the mini batch size. I don't know what that number is. But somehow I feel like it's 64. I don't know why I think it's 64. That's about you know setting up your optimizer. One other, the, the next class of practical concerns that we're going to deal with involves playing with the gradient itself. Now, this is kind of a fun thing. Um, what we saw in the class so far is uh, standard simple stochastic gradient descent. Um, where the parameters are updated by the gradient of one example, or as uh, I just said, the gradient of a mini batch of examples. So I'm writing it like this. So you have parameters, the updated parameters are the old parameters minus some learning rate times GI. GI is the gradient of this current mini batch. This is what we've seen so far. This is what you've been implementing all this while. Everything that you implemented so far was mini batch size equals one. You can easily update your code if you want to include a, a mini batch hyperparameter. Play with that if you're interested. It should not change the convergence properties of any of the models that you're implementing simply because they are all convex. So it should not matter. But let's let's kind of think about what this optimizer is doing. Uh, here's the uh, I always forget what's the name of this kind of a diagram where these level curves or something. Uh, contour, a contour map, thank you. A contour map of uh, the loss surface. Imagine that you have a contour map that looks like this. What this is saying is that the uh, uh, we are, this is a valley that we are going down. And in this direction, it's going down much faster than in this direction. In the horizontal direction, it's a more shallow uh, valley. In the, in in the in on the slide in the vertical direction it's steeper. Now let's say that uh, your learner starts somewhere there and it computes a gradient with one example. And remember, this is not the true gradient of this loss surface. It's a stochastic gradient that's computed using a just one example or maybe a mini batch. And it does not necessarily need to point in the direction of the steepest descent. So maybe it points in that direction there. And you pick the next example and maybe it points this way. And you can basically, you, you might end up with an, uh, 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 the, the learner taking your uh, model through something like this, through a path that looks like that. The problem is that in some directions, gradients change really fast. And in some other directions, gradients might change really slowly. And this could make the process of learning either slow or very fast or generally unstable. Because depending on when you stop, you might actually end up in a bad position. And uh, uh, this, this, this is an undesirable property because remember, 
the stopping criterion is also a little bit of an art. So it's not it's, it's not a scientific thing as to, to determine when exactly your uh, gradient update should stop because all the theory tells us is if you run it to infinity, you'll get to the bottom of this value. So there are a bunch of tricks that have been invented to address these, uh, these sorts of uh, variations in the gradient. One class of tricks involve the idea that if your gradient is going up and down, uh, if your gradient is guiding your model through this sort of a jagged path, what you would really like is to be for it to, uh, to somehow smooth out the path this way. You'd like to smooth the path so that these sort of jagged edges go away. And a common trick that's used to address that is something called to use something called the momentum. A momentum is a moving average of the gradients that, uh, uh, that you keep maintaining. So let's uh, step through this. The earlier version, the standard stochastic gradient was simply parameters is minus eta, that's the learning rate, times the gradient. You replace that with parameters is parameters minus this term here called vp instead of the gradient. v is simply um, an average of vt is simply an average of the previous vt and the current gradient. It's mu times the previous gradient plus some learning rate eta times the current gradient. It's a, it's a moving average. V t minus 1 will be an average of vt minus 2 and that, the gradient at the previous step. So you're, con you're continuously updating. Imagine that mu is a small number between 0 and 1. So you have a little bit of the previous gradient or the accumulated all the gradients that you've accumulated so far plus a lot of the current gradient most of the impact will be based on uh, uh, most of the update in v is the current gradient because eta tip might be larger than mu but you still have some amount of the previous gradient that you're carrying along yes so uh, mu is just a mu is just a scalar then mu is just a number. In fact, that's a good question. Mu is a new hyperparameter. So this uh, the game with neural networks is that uh, you collect all the hyperparameters you can. Uh, we keep bringing in new hyperparameters, and uh, after a point, we there are so many of them that we just let whoever wrote the neural network library to decide default because you can't possibly do cross validation on all. Um, so you pick a reasonable value of the momentum, a common value of the momentum tends to be something like 0.9. Yes. What's the initial value of Vt? Zero. You initialize the zero, so we just start off with the first uh, thing. Other questions? Yes. Um, with, with the value of mu of 0.9, you're probably pretty at a monkey one. You miss a small... Right. Like, I'm imagining... Oh, good point. You you might end up just jumping over. You might. And uh, the hope is if you, well, not the hill, but the valley. Um, mm -hmm. But the hope is that uh, if that happens, you will slow, eventually, as if you run it long enough, you'll converge. Mm -hmm. Because you jump the thing and they'll take the gradient there, it'll point back. And that's the whole uh, game of... And remember, eta t, the learning rate, is always getting smaller and smaller. Over time, the gradients are getting closer and closer to zero. So you are making taking smaller steps eventually. Okay, so this is one sort of a um, neat trick. And uh, there are variants of this momentum trick that have cool names uh, like accelerated gradients and so on. But uh, you can look them up if you're interested. Momentum basically smooths out the update. Uh, rather than taking that jagged update across the loss surface, you're taking a smoother thing because a little bit of the previous update also shows up. If you've ever tried to draw a plot of moving averages of time series, you'll see that the moving average is smoother than a rough time series, a jagged time series. That's what momentum is doing. Another class of tricks give us really cool sounding well new names for algorithms, all of which are basically just stochastic gradient descent with uh, bells and whistles. 
One of them is called Adagrad. Adagrad was, uh, I think, part of the PhD thesis of uh, someone called John Ducci. And the idea is that why should, why should there be a single learning rate that controls all the parameters in your model? What if you, every single parameter in the, in the in your learner, the, in your model, got its own learning rate? The intuition here is, let's say you have two parameters. Let's call them A and B, or W1 and W2. Let's say that the way the data is structured, W1 gets a lot of updates. W1 gets large updates, and W2 gets really tiny updates. The idea of Adagrad is a parameter that gets large updates should have also large, uh, you know, should have smaller step sizes. And a parameter that gets really small updates should have larger step sizes. And that way it takes a loss surface that con conceptually it may take a loss surface that looks like an ellipse and converts it into a circle so that all directions get uh, uh, are equally important. So concretely, the way this is instantiated is you have a hyper, you have a, a learning rate. In, in, in all your code, you implemented eta t is eta divided by one plus t, right? This is how you implemented the learning rate for your code. Instead of one, let's just introduce, call it alpha, some, some number, alpha plus t, so that you don't hit a zero, okay? What is T here? T is the number of updates that have happened so far. Instead of counting the number of updates, what if the update that happens to parameter number i is, instead of this, you have eta t i. Instead of t, you replace this with some square root of ci. Ci is like a number that you keep calculating for every, that, that you keep updating for every parameter. Ci is nothing but the sum of the squares of the gradient of that parameter. So this means that if that parameter i has had huge gradient, then Ci will be really, really large. So this quantity, eta divided by alpha plus root of Ci will be really small. In, con in contrast, if you have a parameter with whose uh, uh, gradients are really tiny, then the sum of the gradients, ci, ci plus the gradient square, the not the, uh, the yeah, the square of the gradient, the sum of the squares of the gradient will also be really small numbers. Because you have you have a sum of a whole bunch of small numbers, the quantity in the box, eta divided by alpha plus the square root of ci can be a large number. So for great small parameters that have seen smaller updates, you take larger steps. For parameters that have seen larger updates, you take smaller steps. And it's called adagrad because it's supposed to be adaptive gradient, where the step size is adapted based on how much uh, it has changed. Questions about this? And the good news is you probably don't have to implement any of these. Uh, any Reasonable neural network library already has implementations of all of these things. And fairly robust ones, I must say. So the whole idea is we will report different parameters in an update at the same at, at, at a relatively same speed, right? Roughly. Even though they might actually the the the, the corresponding features might have different numeric scales. Yes. There's another uh, version here called RMS prop. RMS prop is very much like Adagrad. The only thing that changes is this step gets replaced with this. Instead of CI being CI plus G square, CI is some delta times CI plus one minus delta times uh, G square. So it is a linear combination of the previous C and the current gradient. So what do we have now? We have, uh, how are we counting this? We have on the slide here, three new hyperparameters. No, actually two new. We already had this in the learning rate eta that you actually have in your homework. We have a new alpha and a delta. Okay? 
it's just a minor variant of adagrad i believe the official citation to rms prof is a slide a certain slide number in a lecture in in a class taught by jeff hinton it's not like a published work or something people just cite that lecture so we have these pieces so so far we've seen momentum we've seen adagrad uh, and rms prof what adagrad does is, uh, what momentum does is it smooths out the gradients it smooths out the update uh, adagrad has a personalized uh, learning rate for every parameter and rms prof uh, has a weighted uh, is a weighted version of that the most common optimizer that's used in the, in the literature today is something called adam um, adam combines many different ideas together it uses momentum to smooth its update. It uses uh, this RMS prop type uh, um, approach to choose a, a learning rate adaptively. And then it turns out that if you just do these things, uh, the, learn, the optimizer can, can in, have statistical biases uh, at the beginning of the learning. So there are extra terms in Adam that I'm not going to get into uh, that are there to eliminate those biases. Those extra terms don't come for free. They come with their own hyperparameters. So Adam has like a big collection of hyperparameters that you need to pick. This is the most common optimizer that's used today. And these are, uh, uh, first of all, I mean, you'll see Adam and you'll see a few different variants of Adam, but these are really the, this is really the state of the art today. Um, just remember that all of these are built on stochastic gradient descent. We started off with stochastic gradient descent, threw in many batches. We added momentum. We saw Adagrad, RMS prop, put them, put all of these things together, and you get Adam, provided you add a few more extra bells and whistles for avoiding statistical biases. The nice thing about Adam is it also comes with some theory that uh, promises some robustness. There's a question on uh, Zoom. Are these gradients gradient tricks exclusive to neural networks or can they be applied to any classifier that uses a gradient like logistic regression? In, in, these gradient tricks can be used for any optimization problem. You can use that for logistic regression also. I would argue that it uh, some of these things matter a little less for logistic regression than others, but you can use it for logistic regression too. And it might be worth uh, playing with these ideas. Um, and by the, the other the implied comment there was, uh, are these exclusive to neural networks or uh, can you use it for logistic regression? I would argue logistic regression is also a neural network. It's a neural network with just one layer um, and a sigmoid activation. So it, it still is in the uh, it still is in the uh, box of things that we are playing with. Other questions? Okay, let's now talk about overfitting. It's possible that when you train your neural network for many epochs, you will overfit the data. And this is, of course, a bad situation. How do we avoid this? One answer is you can regularize a neural network. But regularization tends to be a little bit tricky with neural networks because uh, the nice sort of mathematical intuitions that we had for the, the squared uh, the, the the W transpose W for SVM, for example, they tend to not, they, they tend to be a little bit painful to carry over to neural networks. Um, what, instead, an idea that's used is you don't train your neural network all the way to the minimum of the loss function. Our goal is to optimize the loss function. Our goal, in theory, our stated goal is to minimize that function. But it turns out in uh, like in a little bit of a um, um, uh, weird situation here, if you actually train your neural network so much that you actually get to the minimum of the loss function, you might have found that your neural network has overfit the training data. So a common uh, idea that's used is to not train it all the way to the minimum. So it's called early stopping. So you stop your neural network train, you, you stop updating your model after a certain number of epochs or a certain number of updates. 
we've already talked about uh, how to decide when to stop. Uh, a common idea is to have a validation set where you uh, evaluate the accuracy of the or F1 or whatever you care about on the validation set, and you use that to decide when to stop. And uh, I, I spoke about this. You maintain the weight to the best performing model uh, at any point and return it when the performance goes uh, gets start getting worse. Um, if, but the problem with having a validation set is you're losing out on data. You have perfectly good data that you could have used for training and instead you're using that to evaluate when to stop your trainer. And one sort of a, a, a valid approach, though not necessarily uh, um, computationally helpful, is to do k fold cross validation. And then you to get, to get a sense of what is the number of epochs that um, where the model starts overfitting. In theory, that's nice, but in practice, this using k fold cross validation is very rare to see with very, very large models simply because then you have to do k times the work. So, in, in addition to all the other sort of computational effort that you have to do, you have to do all of that k times. So most of the time, we, even as models get larger, we don't see k-fold cross-validation. Instead, we just use a validation set, not just to determine the number of epochs, but also for hyperparameter selection. Um, there's a side question. Do you have any resources on hardware implementations of neural networks? Um, I don't, but uh, I might be able to look things up. And if you send me an email, we can uh, continue that conversation. I try not to think too much about the hardware. Uh, 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 this is one strategy for picking uh, for avoiding overfitting, namely early stopping. Another strategy to avoid overfitting that was born in the neural network universe is something called dropout. Dropout is the standard thing that's done for training these days. It's uh, part of the default uh, toolkit for training neural networks. It's a very, very simple idea. So, imagine that you're training a neural network. So, as you're training during your forward paths and your backward paths, so you you have you're sitting on a mini batch right now. You have a collection of examples on, and you want to compute the gradient. What you do with dropout is you randomly pick some of the neurons in the network, and you disable them. You pretend they don't exist, and you let the rest of the network do the computation. And then you compute the gradient and only update those weights that participated in computing this forward pass. And then you toss out the mini batch, you pick the next mini batch. In the next mini batch, you again randomly select a subset of neurons. So at any point during training, you're only updating a subset of the nodes, subset of the weights. And but uh, the, this choice of which weights are getting updated is random. So uh, you randomly keep choosing which weights to update. And amazingly, it turns out this idea tends to help. Uh, with overfitting. There are many different attempts to explain why dropout works. A couple of them that are interesting. One of them is, the, uh, is to note that by randomly choosing a subset of uh, updating with, uh, let's say, the crossed out uh, nodes are not updated and the other four nodes are updated in this iteration. And maybe in the next iteration, just by accident, only the crossed out nodes are updated. What you're doing now is you're saying that independent of uh, each other, there must be two different ways of getting the right answer. Okay. One via the crossed out nodes and one via the other nodes. So this has an effect of averaging multiple models. Uh, so you're getting something like an ensemble and ensembles tend to be more robust. That's one sort of an intuitive explanation for why dropout might work. Another uh, explanation which which can be proved formally but only for uh, very specific classes of neural networks uh, is that dropout actually corresponds to an implicit regularizer it turns out. By optimizing dropout you are actually optimizing the model with respect to a certain regularizer that you've not written down here. Uh, it's, an, it, it's a procedural method for avoiding overfitting or alternatively it's a procedural approach for um, improving generalization. We've already seen one such approach. Another idea that is purely algorithmic 
to improve generalization. And that's the idea of averaging with average perceptron. Dropout kind of has a similar play. Average perceptron is not uh, regularizing any explicit function. It's not doing any model selection uh, um, or uh, capacity control explicitly, but it tends to improve performance. Dropout has a similar play. It's purely algorithmic. Questions? Um, there is a question here. Does uh, dropout require randomization? And it, do, you, it, it does. Uh, the dropout does require randomization where at every update you need to pick. You, in fact, the way you usually implement it is you have something called a dropout mask, which masks the neural network and only the things that are uh, not masked get updated. Um, important thing to note, a common source of a bug if you don't if you're not careful is that dropout only needs to exist during training at evaluation time at testing all the neurons should be active because you've updated all of them and hopefully all of them are good yes we don't have much um, reduction global optimal. Yes, and in fact, that's this idea here. Uh, you 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 have you look for stagnation in validation accuracy, for example, and that's also all of these. In fact, in practice, both these things are done. You have dropout, and you have um, this um, this threshold for how you define stagnation. The thing is. Both of these introduce new hyperparameters. Dropout introduces a hyperparameter in that what fraction of the waves should be masked during the dropout at every at every update. That's a new hyperparameter, and there are defaults that exist, but uh, it tends to be a little bit of a game to decide what's a good one there. With this one, you need to have some sort of a threshold for how you define that the model has hit the best. Uh, thing and it usually comes with its own hyperparameters. And notice that every slide that I introduce here, I'm saying, yeah, we get one or two new hyperparameters. In addition, we also have that giant collection of hyperparameters that define the architecture of the neural network. And now you see why a uh, lot of modern machine learning involves hyperparameter tuning more than actually learning itself. Speaking of the architecture, you could have to few units, and the system, the, the neural network, might not be expressive enough to capture the two constants. But if you have too many units, then it will be so expressive that it will also capture the noise in the data. So you don't want both extremes. How do you know what to pick? You try, you, and you hope it works. Um, you could do cross validation, uh, or you could use a validation set. All these standard sort of hyperparameter selection tricks come up. Um, one sort of an interesting observation that's come to light in the last maybe few years is if your training data is really, 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 really large, and by that I mean uh, with maybe billions of examples, then having a very, very large model is not a bad thing um, because it's not going to overfit all those billions of examples. So that seems like an interesting. Uh, um, the interesting trend that we are observing. Okay, um, just to wrap up this unit on neural networks. We've seen neural networks. It's uh, it's this templated language. You can think of it as a language, if you will, uh, to define arbitrary functions, continuous functions, or differentiable functions, actually, uh, which are usually uh, organized in layers. You can think of each of these layers as learning and a, a representation, a feature representation, for the next layer to succeed. They are highly expressive. They are a highly expressive family of models, um, which may or may not be a good thing. Uh, maybe highly expressive could also mean highly expressive enough to uh, perfectly capture any noise in the data. We looked at the process of training a neural network. Under that. Basically, I said we use stochastic gradient descent, but there's a problem of computing gradients, actually subgradients. And the answer there is you don't compute any gradients by hand. You just define an algorithm that computes your gradients for you, and that algorithm is called backpropagation. 
There's also the forward pass. The forward pass is simply making predictions to the neural network, given an input going through the network till you get to the output, and that's the forward pass. We did not see a lot of things in this talk, in this unit. It's a very, very, very vast area. It's fast moving. There are many new models, many algorithms for learning that tweak on this uh, SDD approach that keep getting, uh, uh, that keep showing up in the literature all the time. And the, the models themselves are growing a lot, meaning they get bigger. Uh, there are new architectures. There are massive data sets that uh, exist. And there are these named architectures of neural networks. What we saw in class, at least the one that I introduced neural networks with, is a multi-layer perceptron, many layers of perceptron. But you have things like uh, restricted Boltzmann machines and autoencoders that learn um, a latent representation, a hidden representation of the data in a certain, you know, in 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 a in an approach that looks a little bit of a little bit like principal component analysis, but a non-linear version of it. If you've seen PCA. You, it's a good sort of a mental map to that. If you've not seen that, don't worry about it. And then there are convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks were modeled after the mammalian retina and uh, uh, or mammalian visual cortex. And it's one of the default things to do when your input is an image uh, for things like object recognition so on and so on. Sometimes you might, your input might be a sequence. It could be a sequence of things, like a sequence of words. For language, for example. There, if your input's a sequence, the standard sort of an architecture to use is either a recurrent neural network or a transformer. I'm just telling you names. I'm not going to tell you what they are. Uh, and these can encode sequences. These can predict sequences. Notice that at this point, I'm really telling you what classes of what named functions can be used for what types of input. If you have images, think convolution neural nets. If you have sequences, think recurrent neural networks. Then there's this idea of attention, which is such a cool thing, where a neural, a part of the neural network decides what parts of the inputs are relevant given current context and focuses only on that so that a different part of the neural network can use only the relevant things to make a prediction. And both these things are learned together uh, using backpropagation. And both of these are actually neural networks. And there are other um, other sort of uh, named neural networks, like for example, graph neural networks or graph convolutional networks. This is a fast moving area. This is a vast area and way out of the scope of the 10 minutes that I'm spending on this. In fact, if you're interested, you know, if you take a deep learning class. Questions about neural networks, about any of these things that we saw? Yes. Uh, in one of the previous lectures, you mentioned that uh, even if we have one hidden layer in a neural network, uh, if we stack up the number of uh, nodes in that particular layer, uh, we are supposed to, you know, get a classifier which is good enough. Uh, okay, so good enough. I don't know what uh, what good so enough. You mentioned about some study, and you said that uh, if you if we increase the number of nodes uh, in that layer. Uh, we get a good enough. Uh, oh, I think you're talking about it's a it's a uh, it's a theoretical result from Sybenko that says any continuous function can be approximated to arbitrary accuracy using a just a two layer neural network. Yeah, probably. Yes. So uh, my question is uh, in the VC dimension lecture you mentioned that the um, the VC dimension of a neural network is uh, directly proportional to the number of parameters, but we roughly uh, yeah, but we try to you know. Uh, the lower the VC dimension, the better the generalization is. So, yes. So um, good. Right. So uh, okay, good. So let me just uh, summarize all the things that you said because it's an interesting collection of observations that has an implied question. Uh, observation number one is the fact that a two-layer neural network with sufficient width can represent any continuous function, can approximate any continuous function that exists. Observation number two from VC dimension. If the VC dimension is low, we can, uh, the, the, then we are guaranteed better generalization. And the question is, how do these two things square against each other? On one hand, to actually approximate any function, we need a massive, oh, there's a third observation, which is the VC dimension of a neural network is the size of the parameters or square of that or something like that. 
So this is this is this feels like a contradiction here. On one hand, we need the neural network to be large to be able to approximate any function. On the other hand, only if the VC dimension is small are we guaranteed generalization. Turns out that there is a little bit of a, I, I presented things in a slightly sneaky way. So let me see if I can unroll the confusion there. The theory says, the, uh, the, the from learning theory, from uh, Colt, from computational learning theory, what we know is if the VC dimension is low, then we can get good generalization. It does not say anything about if the VC dimension is high. Oh, but the higher the VC dimension, the higher the complexity. Higher the sample complexity. Sure. But even there, it's a one-sided thing. If the, the sample complexity result says, if you have these many examples, then you're guaranteed to, if the number of examples you have is more than this, some function of the VC dimension, then you're guaranteed to get good generalization. It does not explicitly, does not say, if the number of examples is less than that number, you are prohibited generalization. You might still be able to, you might still be able to achieve generalization. The theory has nothing to say about it. And this is actually a big blind spot of today's machine learning theory. All these measures of complexity, VC dimension, there's another one called Rademacher complexity. All of these do not explain the stunning success of neural networks, which by any reasonable measure require a humongous number of training examples to guarantee generalization, but we do not have that number but we still see some generalization because they don't violate the theory. It's just that the theory does not cover that part, which, which is uh, related to the point I think I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, this is an open area for uh, examination. We do not have any strong theory on the successes of the largest neural networks today. Other questions? Yes. So I remember the VC dimension of a linear classifier is E plus one. Mm -hmm. the number of parameters and the, for the neural network is also the number of parameters. Is this a coincidence? It's a it's it's a bit of a coincidence. It's not not always true. In fact, I'll give you an example where in fact I'll give you an example and uh, tell you that this is a and leave it leave the proof as if you are interested a homework. Consider the following classifier: uh, a hypothesis H of X is it's parameterized by a single number C, just one number is uh, sine, oh, is plus one if, let me not put cosine. Okay. This classifier has a VC dimension that's infinite. Uh, C, X is a single number, C is a single number. This classifier has only one parameter, and yet it has an infinite VC dimension. So what we saw was a coincidence. This is a fun proof to think about uh, if you're interested. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, now that we're showing two layers and that we're approximate any function to just even give a, a white amount of, uh, of neurons. Uh, but is the, the reason why we would need more layers because it can take less resources to represent the same function? Yeah, see, that's an interesting question. Um, so this is, a, a, this is an argument that has been, uh, that keeps coming up, uh, depth versus width. Uh, when we talk about deep neural networks, the deep is the depth, uh, meaning the number of layers. Uh, it's not like, you know, it's deep intellectual stuff. Uh, but the it's not particularly clear why you might want to do that. It is true that as the width gets larger, you can represent anything. Depth, as the depth gets larger also, you, the, you get increased expressiveness of the models. But as the depth gets larger, I believe that there are, uh, you, you, I think you can stage your computation more efficiently. And there are practical reasons for, for preferring depth to width. If you have an extremely wide neural network, you're going to have a huge matrix of parameters, a single big matrix. 
And so you're doing a single MAC mult. Whereas with a wide thing, you're doing a sequence of small MAC mults. And that might be more practically feasible. And though, so there are, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why with this, uh, this preferred from a mathematical point. Um, but it seems to definitely be the case that width is uh, de uh, de depth is easier to handle in some sense. I can think of practical reasons. I can't think of any uh, mathematical reasons. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Find the optimal minimum, or it can have its own applications and classification. Oh, uh, okay, good. So, a stochastic gradient descent is just an optimizer. It's just an optimizer, or all of these things, right? So, uh, Adam, for example, it's just Adam optimizer. It's just an optimizer. It all it does is it can find uh, the parameters, uh, but it's an optimizer. If you can set up your prediction problem as an optimization problem. You can use SGD. Uh, interestingly, there's a lot of research recently, or uh, not a lot of, some research recently that also argues that stochastic gradient descent or uh, variants of that, just by their existence, the way they run, they themselves introduce a certain uh, 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 regularization-like effect. So it, why, in addition to optimizing, it also serves to improve generalization. But that's basically it. It's an optimizer. You can use it any place where an optimizer can be used. 